Welcome to the Friends with Money podcast, brought to you by Money Magazine, creating financial freedom for Australians since 1999. Hello and welcome to the Friends with Money podcast. I'm Michelle Baltazar, Editor-in-Chief here at Money Magazine. Thank you for joining us. Now, before we start, I want to say thank you to each and every one of you for listening in. This episode marks our 100th episode, which is a big milestone for us here in the office. We've covered a wide range of saving and investing topics, such as how to grow your super, to negotiating the best home loan, and everything in between. Now, what was interesting is that our most downloaded episode to date was the one titled, Can I Retire Now? And I'll include the link in our show notes. The two other top episodes are a variation of the same theme. People just want to know how to retire early. So what better way to mark our 100th episode than to talk about the golden rules of building wealth with our very special guest. To many of you, he needs no introduction. He is, after all, the founder of Money Magazine and is our editorial advisor. You see him respond to your pressing financial questions through our regular Ask Paul and The Verdict series and have dispensed many words of wisdom that have held true through the ups and downs of the market. Now, we have him today to talk about his top five money rules to live by. Please welcome Paul Clitheroe. Paul, thanks for jopping in. (laughs) My pleasure. The hundredth episode already. ah. Yes. Who knew? Now, just to give you a little bit of context, our first episode was back in July 2021. Mm. And the cash rate target at the time was 0.10%. And the average um, home loan was like a 2%. So now we're at 5%. So the world has changed in the space of, you know, doing our 100 episodes. The world always does. I mean, don't forget I'm a dinosaur. My max mortgage was uh, 1990 at 18.75%. So the, yep, the world the world goes in cycles. My goodness, 18.75. Yeah, that was fun. Had to, had to sell both cars to keep the house. Yeah, that was fun. Oh, my goodness. And now we're going back to that where one of our recommendations for people who are trying to cut cost is if you have two or three cars, maybe it's time to just kind of offload two of them and um, just stick to one. Well, it should probably be one of my top five money tips, really. It isn't. But, uh, yeah, look, a car is what I call a necessary evil. It's such a, you know, such a thing we, you know, we do, many of us need for our work. And in my case now, help, you know, with my wife, getting the grandkids to stuff and so on, you kind of need one, but they are just money eating financial disasters, those cars. Oh yeah. It, it hurts me when I, whenever I have to pay the car insurance, yep. pay for petrol and, and so on and so forth. So now let's get right into it. The top five money rules. Number one, you've said in the past, don't plan to save cash. Tell us about that. Oh, we're humans. Look, the the great, I think the great issue with money is I often, in the federal government body I chair around financial literacy, we we often meet up with other other bodies, for example, the obesity folk and talking about the, you know, a range of stuff. Look, look, I, like all of us, I absolutely know broccoli is better for me than pizza. Look, you know, like I absolutely get it, okay? The only advantage there is in the science around obesity, which is really moving on, which is fantastic. But the the trouble with money is that even if I have a bad pizza day, I can't eat a thousand pizzas. The trouble with money is that one bad day can literally be a thousand pizzas, if you know what I mean. You can really damage yourself. So you can be with money, you can be good 364 days a year. And the other, and I think one way of trying to ensure you can be good and you can eat the money broccoli if you like. The trouble with cash is it sits there like a pizza in your oven. Mm -mm, I've got cash. We humans are humans and I'm as bad as anyone else. We're just dreadful with cash. And so I say to people, look, when I say don't plan to save cash, look, Put it into uh, your mortgage. Put it into your superannuation. Put it into uh, put aside a a separate bank account where you can only take money out and lose all of your interest. For example, you need to put your cash aside. You need some people I know who I do love it. Uh, some people still do like cash, cash, and I know some younger folk who, when they're going out on a Friday night, they don't take a credit card. That sounds a bit radical. They just take their debit card with a set amount. Uh, and um, and basically, I've still got people who are sticking cash under the peas in the freezer. So it's not in their pocket. And the trouble with credit cards, of course, is it brings cash to you all the time. So when I say don't save cash, really, it's if we don't put it somewhere, I think we'll, I think we'll, we'll find a way of spending it. I certainly will. 
Oh, yes. Oh, that happens to me. And this whole tapping culture where you just tap whenever you spend. So you don't really know that, you know, before you realize that you've already spent 600 bucks or something like that, like something um, huge. Now, when you say don't plan to save cash, one way I interpret that as well is that sometimes once you have your kind of salary right at the end of the Mm. month, saving is like your least priority. Mm. You kind of spend it all. And then if you've you've got a hundred bucks, then that's your savings. So I interpret that as well as making sure your priority is the savings first. Do you find that a lot of people find that difficult to do? Of course we do. Of course we do. Look, you know, the, it, it, is, it is really difficult. But if, if saving is, cert- certainly you need to do your rough budget to understand if you can save. If I, a lot of people I do sit down and do budgets with is they're actually spending 10% more than they're earning just in their budget. And so basically what we've got here is an impending personal bankruptcy. Yeah, they're going to go broke. And this mm. is an awful experience. Let, let's not do that, huh? And so really we first of all, we, we need to start the budget, start with the budget because if we're planning to save and we actually have no savings capacity, we're just fooling ourselves. We're going to get really, 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 what you're going to hear all the time is my budget's a failure. Why is your budget a failure? Because we're humans. We, we're optimists. So our budget generally reads like a Buddhist monk. You know, I won't go out. I'll have two beers on Friday. It's, you actually, <laughs> the only way you can do a budget is put the, cut out the crap. The only yeah. way you can do a budget is to actually spend a week or preferably a month and actually write down what you spend. The joy of tapping, by the way, compared to the old days we use cash, the one bonus of ca- tapping is at the end of the month, whether you want to see it or not, you've got a statement. I know. You've, and so, you've so, got evidence of all so, the bad so, money so decisions. In, in many ways, I'd say to anyone who's trying to save money, I'd say, look, just take, I'm sure most people, I mean, I carry no cash these days. That means we have electronic evidence. So at the end of the month, you will find out what you really spend. And then what people do is they go, oh, that was an unusual month. I had two birthday parties and, you know, Fred, Fred turned, you know, 40 or whatever. It's probably a normal month. So what we've got to do is, is the reason for my budget failed, I can't save, is not because you're a bad person. It's like me. We're just humans. Yes. Humans are not destined to save. We are destined to consume. And modern society makes consuming wonderful. You can consume stuff you haven't, eaten, you haven't earned the money for yet. Just use your credit card. Pretty simple, really. So basically, you've got to come up with a budget that's real or you'll feel permanently disappointed. And what I'm hoping is over a period, it might even take you a year, by the way, but I really find that over a year, if people look at that darn statement each month, you actually can get to the point where you wave the tap card less freely. Nice. It's a bit like your health. You know, you've got to make it real. And what we need here is we don't need, you know, uh, you know, look, I must admit I'm carrying a few kilos too much at the moment as well. But to say I'm going to get rid of those kilos in a week is ridiculous, okay? So basically what we've got to do is we've got to reward ourselves for being successful. And the first reward to yourself may simply be only spending what you earn. And you can't save. But at least you're not spending more than you earn. There's your credit card debt. Over time, you actually can by proving to yourself you are being successful. And success is little steps. So just basically don't get stressed about it. Crikey, I can't save. No, you can't save. You're spending more than you earn. You've got records of that. I know you don't want to look at them, but you're going to. You've got to. Let's do it. Now, I like the fact that you've mentioned little steps there because your golden rule number two is save little, save often. How does that work? Yeah, look, I'm a look, I'm a common sense sort of soul. And, you know, the I, I think people just don't realize the power of a dollar, you know. And I know many people haven't. Well, we don't even make one dollar notes anymore, by the way. They used to be brown when I was a kid. Um, but I buy a dollar. It can be a, 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 a whatever, however you spend your money, but a dollar's a dollar. The thing we don't get is that when we earn a dollar, we don't get a dollar. We pay tax. And you can pay as much as 48% tax, including Medicare levy. So your dollar might be 52 cents. Your dollar, if you're a, a typical Australian salary earner, your dollar might be maybe 70 cents. So basically, a dollar is not a dollar. A dollar, in, a dollar might give you 70 cents after tax. The great joy of saving a dollar is you've got a dollar. You, you No tax on your savings, okay? Savings is incredibly powerful. And the other thing people, I think, don't really understand is compound interest. There are, there's so much rubbish about money. I um, mean, there's a couple of truths. And one of the truths is compound interest. The other is risk and return, by the way. We'll come to that later. But compound interest is just critical. And uh, when the Money Show, the precursor of Money Magazine, started about, oh, crikey, we're going, going back into the 1980s now. 
my early stories were all about save little. And it's fascinating. The trouble with saving little is you don't get instantly rewarded. We hate not getting instantly rewarded. What it does for you is you take a 25-year mortgage or a 25-year investment or your super. What saving a small amount does for you, and I get this in the street, got it on the train this morning. Person said, thanks for that tip. Back in the days, about my age, obviously. Thank you for that tip uh, many, many moons ago. And I said, why are you saying that? And I said, well, uh, when you told me to save 10 bucks a week, I thought it was bloody ridiculous. This is exactly what this person said. Thought it was bloody ridiculous. He said, I paid my mortgage off seven years early. That's what that tiny little save, little save often. And you can save, little save often. You build up a few hundred bucks and put it into an ETF. You tip a little bit extra in your superannuation. Um, basically, saving little is the key to this game. Um, and people just don't value that $1 enough. That's the start of your power. I like to talk about, about putting yourself in control. And a real test for me here to listeners is, do you think you're controlling your money? Or is your money controlling you? And if your money's controlling you, you're losing the game. And it's quite easy to fix that one. So we're back to point one, which is start to get control of your money, if you like. Start to get to a point where you can save. Don't plan to save cash. But the, the way we top this up is by saving little, saving often. I like that. And it's all about developing a savings habit, right? Because it may be five bucks today, but it could be 20 bucks next month, or it could be a hundred bucks. And then suddenly it's just part of your it, kind it, of- Look, it can be behavior. anything. It, it, it's just, uh, you know, I think we all, many of these anecdotes, it's pretty easy for me sitting here at 67 and looking back. And younger people, like, I hear it. Home ownership is becoming nearly impossible for young Australians. I'm, I'm, the, 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 but do we just give up? and spend more than we earn and go personally bankrupt? Or do we say, no, hang on a sec. Look, you know, we're, we're not going that path. You know, yes, it is, it, it is hard in so many ways, but money is hard, really hard. But the key to this is to make, give, you will never have any choice in your life if you don't have a few dollars put aside. And the best way is to start with 10 bucks today. Now, before we get onto your third tip, which I think is very important these days when people are trying to play catch up, and I know that you've you've had your personal experience here about um, how to avoid punting and and taking <laughs> silly risks, we'll do that. But um, we might pause there and just think about what you've said there about save little, save often. We will talk about your top two money rules, which I'm looking forward to. But now let's talk about this, avoid punting and silly risks. Why are people so tempted to get the 25% return or, you know, the, the get rich quick schemes? Oh, come on. This is all hard. This is, um, it's, it's back to my, I'd rather eat pizza than broccoli analogy. I absolutely do not blame people. This money stuff, like my, my, guaranteed way to become financially comfortable. It's grindingly hard work. <laughs> I don't have any miracles. I mean, if I did have a miracle, think about it this way. You'd say, well, if you're, if you're a money miracle person, how come you're still working? I always, I always love it when people are selling miracles. You know, <laughs> once in a while, we managed to catch up with one of these people with the TV research, money research team. Um, and once in a while, we'd even get an interview from one of these people uh, selling miracles. And, um, and I, usually, I usually finish off with saying, but this money you're making, stealing from people, what do you do with it? And they go, oh, we, you know, we pay off a house and top up our super and um, we save on a regular basis. So basically the, the, the trouble is, is look, we all want a miracle, okay? And I, I would much rather one. Fun, frankly, look, one miracle I'm happy for people to have a shot at is, is, despite the fact it's completely illogical, is that buying a lotto ticket for five bucks or something is, you know, is, is one way of having a shot. You've got a one in 7.2 million chance of winning. I'd personally rather you added the $5 to your savings because <laughs> then, then you will be much better off in 40 years' time. So, I, I, look, I truly understand that there's – look, a miracle is, is, a, is a much better idea, a free car, a free house, 25%, whatever. The only way I can really ask our listeners to think about this is that if someone is offering me, you know, returns like that, call it, call it 25%, basically means your money is doubling in a bit under every three years. So what you say to the person offering 25% is like, well, let's say I, I start with 10. So three years later, it's 20. 
it's 40, it's 80, 160, 320, 640, $1.28 million is rounded out, call it 1.3. Then it's 2.6 million three years later, 5.2 million three years later. And what we actually do at 25% per annum is you actually end up owning all the assets on the planet and the universe in a long lifetime. So it's got to be crap. Doesn't okay. Make sense. It's got to be crap. And so, you know, if people are, people are telling you stuff, which in, it, if you think for one minute, you cannot get 25% per annum year after year after year, or you will own the universe. Okay. And so, and some of these offerings, of course, are, are here's, here's 60% on my share trading scheme, and it's only going to cost you, you know, $5,000 or whatever it may be. What do you think that person's doing with the $5,000 that's going to make 60%? Probably saving it because they know full well, just look, just get your calculator and put a couple of thousand dollars and add 60% per annum. You'll soon own the universe. Pretty much sounds like a Ponzi scheme to me when someone says they, they'd be able to give you whatever it is, 50%, 60%. Uh, yeah, some, sometimes it's more simple than a Ponzi. You know, the, the Ponzi's are, are relatively complicated because, you know, they are paying initial investors back. Don't forget, you know, it's how the Ponzi works. I promise you 60%. And then after a year, you get 60%. You tell all your friends. So the early investors in a Ponzi can often get quite rich and all the people around them get devastated. Most of these 25% and share trading schemes and property schemes, these things are very simple to understand. They are straight, outright fraud. No one, no one gets a cent back. These people are just stealing your money. So there you have it. Avoid punting and taking on those silly risks. All right, we're down to our top Two. Uh, number four. Now let's, this is one of my favorite topics, Paul, and, and <laughs> I have been topping up my super, but you've said in the past, superannuation is good, invest in it. Tell us more about that. Well, look, it, it's, the weird thing is, is that superannuation at times can also be bad. Um, we need to start with younger Australians. Um, and I've done this, with my three kids are now getting towards their thirties. But when they were first starting to do part-time jobs and so on as 18-year-olds, I said, just take the minimum in super. Because the trouble for an 18-year-old is you're probably looking forwards close to 50 years to your super. And it's not money you've got maybe for a holiday or a house deposit or other stuff. So I, I think super becomes a lot more powerful as we get a bit older. And in particular, where super becomes really powerful is when your tax rate goes up. Now, I'm a, a maximum taxpayer. I'll pick on myself. I won't pick on you, Michelle. I'm a max taxpayer, including Medicare levy. Call it 48%. So if I've got a dollar, I can take it home, and I've got 52 cents to invest fifty two or spend 52 cents out of my dollar after tax. Or up to the maximum of $27,500 a year, I can salary sacrifice. I can take money from my salary, put it to super, and pay 15% tax. Now, what's going to make me richer? 52 cents in my pocket or 85 cents in my super. And the other huge issue for me over the last 20 years is that it removes legislation risk of super. I was getting so close, and now if I wanted to, I could take all my money out of super if I wanted to. Now I'm 67. I'd need to be a raving lunatic to do that because it's an tax sheltered environment. I can simply take what I need uh, whenever I like. But basically, when I thought about super, and unfortunately, I missed the first couple of really decades of super. I'm too old. Um, but what I'd say is if you're really young, uh, and by really young, it probably means anyone about 60 these days. But if you're in your 18, your early 20s, and you're thinking, gee whiz, should I be struggling to get every cent in super today? And maybe that means I, I can't contemplate a house deposit. Probably not, Michelle. And also, don't forget, super becomes more powerful as your tax rate goes up. So I think super becomes probably bluntly, I think until your midlife for most people, I think super is what the boss is putting in for you. I think it's compulsory contributions. But as you get towards your midlife, or if you happen to be really successful, you start earning bigger money earlier in your career, you start paying a lot of tax. If you're paying tax anywhere near 48%, why would you choose 48% tax over 15% tax? And once you're inside superannuation, you only pay 15% tax on your income, 10% tax on capital gains, whereas I pay 48% on any income I earn, uh, and I pay uh, about 24% on capital gains. Super is, is not some magical web, and it's just a tax vehicle. Uh, but you can't get the money out under until most circumstances retire. until you retire. So for mine, superannuation is, is, is magic, but I, I suspect for most Australians, it's probably closer to a midlife issue or if you happen to have a very successful career, absolutely don't pay max tax when you can pay 15%. You don't need to be Albert Einstein. I'm a personal kind of... I 
testimony on that because if not for super, I wouldn't be like looking at this. Oh my God, I've, I've saved this much simply because I've been working full time since I was in my 20s. Called compound interest and saving little, saving often. That's there we go. It. You've wrapped up my early rules. Thank exactly, you, Michelle. Exactly, exactly. All right, countdown to the number one golden rule, and that is have a plan. Yeah, look, it, it's control. And I, look, I don't want to get overly anal about this. I'll drive people insane. Um, you know, I, I see lists of stuff people hate doing. Um, and on the lists of hate doing, uh, very regularly I get uh, giving a speech in public. Um, number two, anything to do with control of your money. I do have to laugh sometimes. We get these really funny bits of research coming out. We spend about 20 times, 20, uh, 20 times more time planning our annual holidays than we do planning our money. And That's insane. You, no, you, you see, no, you see, and I, well, but hang on, let's think about we humans. We're wonderful creatures. I, I like humans. I'm, an, I'm a real optimist. But holidays are fun, you know. Hey, that's great fun. So the trouble is, though, is that if you don't take control of your money, it will control you. And look, Maybe maybe your money being control of you when you're young. Look, I can remember this in my uni days where I was very poor with money. Money meant beer, basically. It's pretty simple back in my uni days. Um, and so quite often on a Saturday morning, I'd be up with a mate at 4 a.m. Uh, delivering local newspapers, putting them in people's letterboxes, because we could earn about, back then, we could earn about $14 between us for doing that. Um, here's inflation for you. A schooner of beer was 33 cents. So basically that was 21 schooners each, which was a full weekend of partying. But no planning, no control. If we wanted to go to a party, we had to deliver newspapers. Now, funnily enough, when you're 18, that's actually pretty funny. You know, we'd wander around, deliver papers, chat. People would make us a cup of tea and, you know, have a chat. Um, it really wasn't that bad. But today for me to go out and deliver papers at 67 for a cup of coffee, Michelle, can't do it. If you don't, if you don't get in control of your health, and you don't get in yes. control of your money, and some things we cannot help with your health, we can get stuff we can't control: a cancer, an accident. Look, bad things happen. Okay, uh, and with your money, bad things can happen as well. Car breaks down, you know, you name it. But if you don't get, if you don't teach yourself to get in control of your money. And that's the main thing. I don't expect anyone from go to bad to good with money, even in a couple of years. It's basically getting yourself in control of your money and controlling, and control, by the way, may simply be not blowing out your credit card every month. Mm. Now, honestly, it we just need small winning steps in the battle to be in control. I just don't want people, if they, I really don't want people in a position where they can't find a few dollars for a cup of coffee at my age. And it's not necessary in nearly all circumstances. We can control a lot with our personal spending habits. We're not going to like it. It's pretty awful, but we actually can be in control. There's a lot of good stuff in a country like Australia that doesn't cost you much, you know. The beach is pretty good, you know, and you actually don't need nine beers on the way home. Exactly. And I like the idea of just small wins, you know, yeah, just the, just a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, fourteen dollars. It doesn't matter. Yeah, don't make it. Yeah. If you're saying, oh, my God, I can never afford a house. Um, and I get that uh, through some of the, the programs I get involved in with the federal government around financial literacy. We're now moving into our 20th year. We've got a horde of case studies where people who say we can never afford a home. It's totally impossible. Never happening. Blah, blah, blah. After a couple of decades of being in control. Guess what? They can start to buy. Might be a small apartment, by the way. Might not be exactly where you want to live. You may need to make compromises with money. I can tell you right now, the first place that we bought, a minute semi on about the busiest road in Sydney, was not exactly our grand ambition, okay, but it was a start. We had to compromise heavily. It was nothing like what we wanted. But thank heavens we made that compromise. Uh, so the world is not always perfect, but it's not going to be perfect. You've mm. got to control what you can control. Yes, I agree. So there you have it. The five money rules to live by, according to Paul Clitheroe. Paul, you've been absolutely fantastic. We have to do this, you know, again, because I think people need to to know, you know, these words of wisdom from, from years of from, investing. From, from a dinosaur. <laughs> no, from, <laughs> you know, like looking back and and especially for me, I wish I listened to someone when I was in my 30s who said to me, Michelle, even 20 bucks a month can make a big difference. I mean, compound interest, like you said. Once again, thank you, Paul. Pleasure.
Before we go, don't forget that if you enjoy listening to the Friends with Money podcast, we'd love for you to recommend it to your own friends and family, or you can help us out by leaving a review on iTunes or the Apple Podcast app. You can also send in any questions, comments, or even topics um, for our next Ask Paul, maybe, on our email, podcast at moneymag.com.au. And finally, make sure you head over to moneymag.com.au for all the latest financial news and stories. That's it for this episode. I'm Michelle Baltazar. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Friends with Money podcast. For credible, independent and easy to understand financial commentary, visit moneymag.com.au. Please remember that the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are general in nature and further independent advice and research based on your personal circumstances should be sought before making an investment decision.